His no-nonsense style combined with practical and simple wisdom makes him, to me, the greatest Stoic teacher of the time. Epictetus was born into slavery around 55 AD. The name, Epictetus, translates to acquired. So, while his parents likely gave him his own name, it's been lost to history. His early life was one of service. However, with the permission of his master, he was allowed to study Stoicism under Gaius Musonius Rufus, who we'll cover later on. This study started Epictetus on the path of the philosopher, and with the fall of Emperor Nero, Epictetus secured his freedom. This allowed him to teach his own brand of Stoicism. His lectures were transcribed by his student Arian into the Discourses and the Enchiridion. These two books now form some of the best surviving Stoic teachings from the ancient world and are my personal favorites. Below is a collection of hand-picked quotes from Epictetus. It's not what happens to you, but how you react to it that matters. He who laughs at himself never runs out of things to laugh at. Only the educated are free. Some things are in our control, and others not. Things in our control are opinion, pursuit, desire, aversion, and, in a word, whatever are our own actions. Things not in our control are body, property, reputation, command, and, in one word, whatever are not our actions. The greater the difficulty, the more glory in surmounting it. Skillful pilots gain their reputation from storms and tempests. He is a wise man who does not grieve for the things which he has not, but rejoices for those which he has. Seek not the good in external things, seek it in yourselves. People are not disturbed by things, but by the views they take of them. If anyone tells you that a certain person speaks ill of you, do not make excuses about what is said of you, but answer, he was ignorant of my other faults, else he would not have mentioned these alone. Any person capable of angering you becomes your master. He can anger you only when you permit yourself to be disturbed by him. Wealth consists not in having great possessions, but in having few wants. Don't explain your philosophy, embody it. To accuse others for one's own misfortune is a sign of want of education. To accuse oneself shows that one's education has begun. To accuse neither oneself nor others shows that one's education is complete. Is there a connection between Stoicism and social justice, understood in the modern sense of the term? I'm not talking about the often pejorative term social justice warrior with its very particular political meaning, but rather of the general philosophical concept, which has a long and complex history. Social justice is a concept of fair and just relations between the individual and society. This is measured by the explicit and tacit terms for the distribution of wealth opportunities for personal activity and social privileges. In Western as well as in older Asian cultures, the concept of social justice has often referred to the process of ensuring that individuals fulfill their societal roles and receive what was their due from society. In the current global grassroots movements for social justice, the emphasis has been on the breaking of barriers for social mobility, the creation of safety nets, and economic justice. Wiki article. Typical names that come up in this context are those of philosophers like John Rawls and Thomas Pogg. More generally, though, is Stoicism leaning toward particular political positions? If the Stoics advised us to follow nature, and if reality, as the comedian Stephen Colbert once joked, has a liberal bias, does that mean that a im well, it's complicated? My general take about the relationship between Stoicism and both religion and politics is that the philosophy is compatible with a number of positions in both areas of concern, though obviously, not all. It is hard to imagine a fundamentalist Christian Stoic, for instance, since the notion that evolution did not take place, or that the Earth is only millennia old, flies in the face of the best science, and Stoics ought to be scientifically as informed as possible. See the field of study of physics. Similarly, it is hard to imagine a Stoic Nazi as that political ideology is incompatible with any reasonable understanding of the virtue of justice, not to mention with the concept of cosmopolitanism. But can we say anything more about this crucial topic? I believe we can, but not everyone is going to like my take. 
A major resource about social justice within Stoic philosophy comes from the so-called cradle argument, the Stoic take on moral developmental psychology. A modern version is found in Larry Becker's A New Stoicism, see this commentary. But the classic rendition is located in Cicero's Odern Stoic is committed to be a progressive liberal in political terms. It is the view of those whose system I adopt, that immediately upon birth, for that is the proper point to start from, a living creature feels an attachment for itself, and an impulse to preserve itself, and to feel affection for its own constitution, and for those things which tend to preserve that constitution. Infants desire things conducive to their health, and reject things that are the opposite before they have ever felt pleasure or pain. This would not be the case, unless they felt an affection for their own constitution and were afraid of destruction. Man's first attraction thus, is towards the things in accordance with nature. But as soon as he has understanding, or rather become capable of conception, and has discerned the order and so to speak harmony that governs conduct, he thereupon esteems this harmony far more highly than all the things for which he originally felt an affection, and by exercise of intelligence and reason infers the conclusion that herein resides the chief good of man, the thing that is praiseworthy and desirable for its own sake, i.e., moral virtue. Tarkri 5 21. The logical progression implied in these passages can be summarized as follows. Human infant. Selfishness. Young child. Instinctive concern for caretakers and close others. Age of reason 7 plus. Concern for others begins to expand due to reason. Adult. Further expansion of concern for others. Abstract thoughts. Prokopton bandang. Prokoptusa. Conscious practice of virtue. Cosmopolitanism. Seiji, perfected virtue. What this does is to establish that, according to Stoic philosophy, human beings come to be concerned about others by a combination of two processes, our natural instincts as social beings and our capacity to reason about our problems. Hence Marcus's injunction to, you are a citizen of the cosmos and a part of it, and not a subordinate part, but a principal part of it. For you are capable of understanding the divine administration and of reasoning on what follows from that. What then is the profession of a citizen of the world? To have no private gain, never to deliberate as though detached from the whole, but to be like the hand or the foot which, if they had reason and understood the constitution of nature, would never exercise impulse or desire except by reference to the whole. It is the view of those whose system I adopt, that immediately upon birth, for that is the proper point to start from, a living creature feels an attachment for itself, and an impulse to preserve itself, and to feel affection for its own constitution, and for those things which tend to preserve that constitution. Infants desire things conducive to their health, and reject things that are the opposite before they have ever felt pleasure or pain. This would not be the case unless they felt an affection for their own constitution and were afraid of destruction. Man's first attraction, thus, is towards the things in accordance with nature. But as soon as he has understanding, or rather become capable of conception, and has discerned the order and so to speak harmony that governs conduct, he thereupon esteems this harmony far more highly than all the things for which he originally felt an affection, and by exercise of intelligence and reason infers the conclusion that herein resides the chief good of man, the thing that is praiseworthy and desirable for its own sake, i.e., moral virtue. Diderot 521. The logical progression implied in these passages can be summarized as follows. Human infant. Selfishness. Young child. Instinctive concern for caretakers and close others. Age of reason. Seven plus. Concern for others begins to expand due to reason go adult. Further expansion of concern for others. Abstract thoughts. Prokopton. Prokoptusa. Conscious practice of virtue. Cosmopolitanism. Sager. Perfected virtue. What this does is to establish that, according to Stoic philosophy, human beings come to be concerned about others by a combination of two processes. Our natural instincts as social beings, and our capacity to reason about our problems. Hence Marcus's injunction to, you are a citizen of the cosmos, and a part of it.
and not a subordinate part, but a principal part of it. For you are capable of understanding the divine administration and of reasoning on what follows from that. What then is the profession of a citizen of the world? To have no private gain, never to deliberate as though detached from the whole, but to be like the hand or the foot, which, if they had reason and understood the constitution of nature, would never exercise impulse or desire except by reference to the whole. Still, we are short on specifics, and what I've said so far is arguably compatible with a number of progressive liberal policies, but also with some libertarian or conservative ones, to use the parlance of contemporary American politics. As it should be. One of the things that makes Stoicism a timeless philosophy, just like the case of, say, Buddhism or Christianity, is precisely the fact that it sets out general principles from which reasonable people may derive specific actions to carry out. The trouble is that reasonable people may reasonably disagree on what such actions ought to be, because the principles, not just stoic ones, but pretty much any sufficiently broad and interesting principle, underdetermine, as philosophers are want to say, the ways to implement them. Contra much current political discourse, to use the term charitably, there often isn't a single solution to complex problems, and the possible solutions are probably not going to be simple anyway. So how do we then bridge the gap between stoic precepts, or generally, virtue, ethical ones, and specific policies concerning social justice? By moving into the empirical domain, and specifically by applying inductive reasoning to observations about human affairs. Crucially, though, this isn't a simple matter of handing over ethical decisions to disciplines such as economics or psychology. It is, rather, an approach that requires us to take on board research in those disciplines while being informed by an ethical perspective, in our case specifically a stoic one. Consider economics, for instance, and in particular the issue of social responsibility on the part of corporations. As reflected in the debate between supporters of stockholders and stakeholders' theories, stockholders' theory is also known as the Friedman Doctrine, named after economist Milton Friedman. This approach views stockholders as the economic engine of the organization and the only group to which the firm must be socially responsible. As such, the goal of the firm is to maximize profits and return a portion of those profits to stockholders as a reward for the risk they took in investing in the firm. Friedman advocates that the stockholders can then decide for themselves what social initiatives to take part in, rather than having their appointed executive whom they appointed for business reasons decide for them. Wiki article. Contrast the above with the tenets of shareholders' theory, often associated with the work of R. Edward Freeman. In the traditional view of a company, the stockholder view, only the owners or stockholders of the company are important, and the company has a binding fiduciary duty to put their needs first, to increase value for them. Stakeholder theory instead argues that there are other parties involved, including employees, customers, suppliers, financiers, communities, governmental bodies, political groups, trade associations, and trade unions. Wiki article. It should be clear at first glance that stockholders' theory is typically favored by conservatives and libertarians, while stakeholders' theory is the go-to framework for liberal progressives. Who is right? The answer depends on the interrelation of values and empirical evidence. While it may superficially appear that the values underlying the two approaches are mutually incompatible, a closer look reveals that they share at least one fundamental value in common. Consent. What stockholders' theorists object to is the idea that decisions about the company's management be imposed on owners by people outside the company itself, who have not invested money, and hence taken on risks, in the company. Similarly, stakeholders' theorists are also concerned with consent, this time of people outside company management, workers, citizens of the local community, who are going to suffer potentially grave consequences from actions imposed by stockholders without broader consultation. Violation of consent results in potential loss of money for stockholders and in potential loss of jobs or a lowered quality of life for stakeholders. One approach informed by Stoic philosophy here is that the virtue of justice requires that we treat others with fairness, 
While the notion of cosmopolitanism means that we should consider all people involved as equally deserving of regard. This, however, does not necessarily favor stakeholders' theory, as it may at first appear. It only means that we can reasonably remind stockholders in a particular company that they will also at the same time be stakeholders from the point of view of other companies in which they are not invested. It would then be unreasonable, i.e., a violation of the logos, for any corporate manager to actually think that a company ought to be able to do whatever necessary to maximize profit, even at the cost of the world going to hell in a handbasket, as they say. The in practical terms, the two sides are not as far from each other as it may seem. Let's take a specific example. Apple has recently gotten into trouble in terms of public perception because of the famous Paradise Papers, showing that the company has looked for places where to store huge amounts of money. It saved over two decades during which it benefited from artificially low taxes in Ireland. If Apple brought that money back to the US, it would face a huge tax bill. Clearly, that would go against the interest of the company's stockholders. Equally clearly, it would benefit a large number of stakeholders, for instance, the taxpayers of the United States of America, or even all of its citizens, who would presumably benefit from services that could be paid for with that tax money. Apple, however, has raised a standard corporate defense of its practices, arguing that it pays every dollar it owes in every country around the world. This is probably true, meaning that there is no evidence that Apple has engaged in illegal practices. The fact remains, though, that Apple's behavior has arguably been unethical, knowingly taking advantage of a loophole that allowed them to pay taxes at the ridiculously low rate of 0.05%. For comparison, the recent rate in the U.S. has been 35% and is about to be lowered by a new Republican bill to 20% which is still 4,000 times higher than what Apple got away with. And before anyone thinks that Apple is an anomaly, it isn't. The very same discussion is currently going on within the European community concerning Google. At this point, there are two possible courses of action we as a society can take against Apple. On the one hand, we can use stockholders' theory against them in a sort of socio-financial judo move and start a boycott until the company decides to do the right thing. The idea here is that company management is bound, legally and morally, to maximize stockholders' profit, and if that profit is going to be hampered by an international boycott, then management will act accordingly. On the other hand, invoking stakeholders' theory, we could push for legislation, in either or both the US and the European community, that closes the loophole and makes such actions illegal and punishable by fines against the company and or jail for its managers. My point is that Stoic philosophy should lead one, regardless of political inclinations, to conclude that Apple has indeed misbehaved. If Apple were a person, I mean a physica, I don't have the answer, because the problem is complex and the relevant information hard to come by and subject to disputation. Nonetheless, there is going to be an empirical answer, if only couched in probabilistic terms. As a Stoic, then, I will favor whatever actual course of action is more likely to result in correcting the problem that my virtue ethical grounding has identified, regardless of which side of the political spectrum favors which solution. This approach, I believe, is generalizable to any societal problem in the following three-step fashion that relates the procedure to the three fields of study constituting the Stoic curriculum. I use the philosophical framework to decide in broad terms what is the virtuous thing to do. Stoic ethics. I, I acquire as much relevant empirical evidence as possible. Stoic physics. I, I use your reason to determine the best empirical way to improve the ethical situation. Stoic logic. Or as Marcus put it, the ancient Stoics were famous or infamous, depending on whom one asks, for promulgating doctrines that sounded paradoxical. Indeed, Cicero wrote an entire book called Paradoxa Stoicorum, my commentary here, in which he tried to explain six of them. Paradox here, however, does not literally mean something that is logically contradictory, or that otherwise appears to violate the laws of logic. Rather, it simply means a notion so odd that it is hard to imagine that serious philosophers, such as the Stoics certainly were, ever actually said that. 
The Stoic motto, live according to nature, certainly falls into this category. And yet, it is a fundamental aspect of Stoic doctrine, so it is important to understand exactly what the Stoics said, and what they meant by it. One thing the phrase does not mean, is that we should go running naked into the nearest forest, stopping to hug trees from time to time. Another thing it does not mean, is an appeal to nature. The latter is a well-known informal logical fallacy, and according to G. Moore, in his Principia Ethica of 1903, it consists in claiming that a thing is good because it is natural, or bad because it is unnatural. This is related to, but not the same, as David Hume's is hot gap, often referred to as the naturalistic fallacy. We will turn to that one in a minute. It should be pretty obvious that appealing to nature to determine what is good or bad is not a sound procedure. Vaccines are unnatural, meaning that they are human creations. Of course, humans themselves are part of nature, but you see the distinction. And yet they are good for us. Anti-vax pseudoscientific nonsense notwithstanding. By contrast, tsunamis are most definitely natural, and yet they are bad for both human beings and other animals on Earth, who happen to be so unfortunate as to experience their effects. The Stoics, as we shall see, were not invoking a logical fallacy when they exhorted us to live according to nature. What they were doing, however, is much closer to rejecting David Hume's postulation that there is an unbridgeable, or at least very hard to bridge, gap between is and ought, i.e., between facts about the world and moral values. Here is how Hume himself famously put it, in a treatise of human nature, 1739. In every system of morality which I have hitherto met with, I have always remarked that the author proceeds for some time in the ordinary way of reasoning and establishes the being of a god or makes observations concerning human affairs. When of a sudden I am surprised to find that instead of the usual copulations of propositions, is and is not, I meet with no proposition that is not connected with an ought or an ought not. This change is imperceptible, but is, however, of the last consequence. For as this ought or ought not expresses some new relation or affirmation, tis necessary that it should be observed and explained, and at the same time that a reason should be given, for what seems altogether inconceivable, how this new relation can be a deduction from others, which are entirely different from it. In truth, it is not clear here whether Hume is saying that the is ought gap cannot be bridged, or simply warning us that if one wishes to bridge it then one ought, ah, uh, to provide explicit arguments, and not just accomplish the feat by sleight of hand. In a talk that I gave earlier this year at Oxford, slides here, video here, I argued for the latter, and connected this to two facts about Hume. I, he developed a theory of human nature that is compatible with a naturalistic understanding of ethics, and hence with a bridge between is and ought and I, I, he was actually sympathetic to Stoic philosophy, though not a Stoic himself, see this previous post. Hume proposed a progressive theory of human nature as part. Briefly, Mandeville argued that human beings are naturally self-interested, while Hutcheson and Cooper thought that we are naturally benevolent. Hume came down somewhere in the middle, suggesting that human nature is really a mix of the two, as we both have instincts that are aimed at self-preservation as well as instincts that make us a naturally social and cooperative animal. Our social virtues, Hume added, then develop further because of reflection, cultural forces, and habit. Tis by society alone that man is able to supply his defects. By society all his infirmities are compensated, and though in that situation his wants multiply every moment on him, Yet his abilities are still more augmented and leave him in every respect more satisfied and happy than tis possible for him in his savage and solitary condition ever to become. A Treatise of Human Nature, 479. Hume scholar Michael Gill explains, People initially care about justice and other socially valuable virtues because it accords with self-interest, Hume tells us here. But over time, they develop mental associations that lead them to approve of justice even when it does not promote their self-interest, and to disapprove of injustice even when it does promote their self-interest. 
Hume's progressive view of human nature. Hume studies Kiari Sakai. 1 27 108 2000. As we shall see, this is the Enlightenment version of the Stoic cradle argument, and does in fact provide the basis for a philosophically sound bridging of the is ought gap. It is also part of the justification for the Stoic dictum that we should live according to nature. Let's turn now to the Stoics. In volume E of De Finibus Bonorum et Malorum, on the ends of good and evil, my commentary here and here, Cicero Imaginus Cato the Younger explaining things to him. It is the view of those whose system I adopt, that immediately upon birth, for that is the proper point to start from, a living creature feels an attachment for itself, and an impulse to preserve itself, and to feel affection for its own constitution, and for those things which tend to preserve that constitution. Infants desire things conducive to their health, and reject things that are the opposite before they have ever felt pleasure or pain. This would not be the case unless they felt an affection for their own constitution and were afraid of destruction. Dari 5. Man's first attraction is towards the things in accordance with nature. But as soon as he has understanding, or rather become capable of conception, and has discerned the order and, so to speak, harmony that governs conduct, he thereupon esteems this harmony far more highly than all the things for which he originally felt an affection, and by exercise of intelligence and reason infers the conclusion that herein resides the chief good of man, the thing that is praiseworthy and desirable for its own sake, i.e., moral virtue. 321. It should be clear why this is essentially Hume's view, or rather, the other way around since Hume not only lived 18 centuries after Cicero, but we have direct evidence that he was influenced by the Stoics. It should also be clear why this is often referred to as the cradle argument. It is a developmental account of how we gradually move from purely selfish interests to more and more socially oriented ones as a result of upbringing, chiefly teachings from our caretakers, as well as our own ability to reflect on what makes sense and what doesn't, and to behave accordingly. The other major source on the Stoic idea of living according to nature is Diogenes Lercius, who in Book 7 of The Lives and Opinions of the Eminent Philosophers wrote, An animal's first impulse, say the Stoics, is to self-preservation, because nature from the outset endears it to itself, as Chrysippus affirms in the first book of his work, On Ends. His words are, the dearest thing to every animal is its own constitution and its consciousness thereof, for it was not likely that nature should estrange the living thing from itself, or that she should leave the creature she has made without either estrangement from or affection for its own constitution. We are forced then to conclude that nature in constituting the animal made it near and dear to itself, for so it comes to repel all that is injurious and give free access to all that is serviceable or akin to it. For animals, say the Stoics, nature's rule is to follow the direction of impulse. But when reason by way of a more perfect leadership has been bestowed on the beings we call rational, for them life according to reason rightly becomes the natural life. For reason supervenes to shape impulse scientifically. This is why Zeno was the first, in his treatise on the nature of man, to designate as the end, life in agreement with nature, or living agreeably to nature which is the same as a virtuous Li. Several things need to be observed in the long passage above. To begin with, again, this is a developmental account of human social psychology. Second, Diogenes tells us that this notion appeared at the very beginning of Stoic philosophy, with Zeno, Cleanthes, and Chrysippus, respectively the first, second, and third heads of the Stoa. Finally, Living according to nature in the sense above leads us to live virtuously, because the virtues, practical wisdom, courage, justice, and temperance, are the means by which we rationally govern our intercourse with fellow human beings. Or as Socrates says in the Euthydemus, see separate essay here, virtue is the chief good, because it is the only thing that can never be used for ill, unlike wealth, health, education, and all the other preferred indifference. As I have explained in a series of recent posts, the cradle argument has been reconstructed in a philosophically sound way, and one moreover that agrees with modern cognitive science by Larry Becker in his A New Stoicism.
We may begin life as greedy little egoists, but it is clear enough that we soon spontaneously develop matching effective responses to what we read as signs of others' pleasures and pains. Cognitive development is relentlessly recursive, leg over leg, as Piaget and say, in the sense that whatever conceptual schemas we develop and whatever content we acquire in them themselves become the objects of, and determinants of, our subsequent development. As we develop and begin to use the ability to represent this purposive activity symbolically, and begin to manipulate those symbolic representations logically, a secondary form of agency arises, driven by this representational and logical activity. The process of deliberation, and my original research background is in evolutionary biology, and it is interesting to me that the above meshes very nicely with what primatologists have discovered about our close evolutionary kins over the past couple of decades or so. Just check out Franz de Waal's Primates and Philosophers for a good sense of a combined scientific and philosophical approach to the evolution of morality. Studies conducted on chimpanzees, macaque, rhesus monkeys, and capuchin monkeys show the presence in social primates of four building blocks of morality. Empathy, the ability to learn and follow social rules, reciprocity, and peacemaking. So the life science choice becomes a determinative condition of, some of, our conduct. Chirach 6. It is also interesting to note that the words ethics and morality themselves have revealing roots. The first one comes from the Greek ethos, a word related to our idea of character. The second one is from the Latin moralis, which has to do with habits and customs. Ethics or morality, in the ancient sense then, is what we do in order to live well together, just like our primate cousins. Except, of course, that unlike bonobos and capuchin monkeys, we can articulate and reflect on our own behaviors, which leads us to the more sophisticated, rationally based sense of living according to nature that the Stoics were defending. As for modern cognitive sciences, which I see as an extension of the life sciences to the special case of humans, Jean Piaget found that young children are focused on authority mandates and that with age children become autonomous evaluating actions from a set of independent principles of morality. Famously, Lawrence Kohlberg expanded upon Piaget in notions of moral development to arrive at his three-level classification of attitudes toward morality. The way I see it, evolutionary biology, cognitive science, and philosophy provide us with a fuller picture of ethics. The first one tells us something about why we have a moral instinct in the first place. We are inherently social animals so natural selection favored the evolution of pro-social behaviors. The second one informs us about how modern human beings with their large brains and cultural milieu develop complex views of morality from infancy through adulthood. And the third one helps us further develop the logical consequences of our own thinking about how to relate to others. For instance, arriving at the related stoic principles of archaeosis and cosmopolitanism, famously articulated by Heracles, with his ideas of a series of contracting circles of concern. Most of chapter 6 is then devoted to slowly building an argument for why the above is indeed the case. Becker begins by considering the development of virtue through agency. An important component of this argument relies on the already advanced idea, chapter 5, that agency acts recursively, perfecting itself through acting on itself, Remember the contrast between agency and any other human mental or physiological process, like digestion. If virtue is essentially indistinguishable from perfected agency, then virtue itself, like everything that is perfect, does not admit of degrees. But agentic activity makes progress toward the state of perfected agency, and so similarly, there is progress in virtuous activity toward virtue itself. This rather elegantly, and a bit more clearly, recovers the ancient Stoic notion that one can make progress. After all, students of Stoicism referred to themselves as Prokoptontes, M, and Prokoptusai, F, I, E, E, those who make progress. And yet that all but the sage are unvirtuous, because we then need to talk about the nature of agency. Agency, maintains Larry, is constituted by elements that may be received i.e. arrived at without the aid of one's agency, or constructed, i.e. 
resulting from the exercise of one's agent. To begin with, there is the classic stoic cradle argument, the observation, supported by modern developmental psychology, that agency emerges during the normal course of human development, initially as a natural, instinctive behavior, and later, gradually, as a behavior shaped by external influences, habit, and conscious reflection and decision-making. Notice the qualification normal. As Larry Dryley puts it, question, what is worse than a psychopath? Answer, a psychopath with really strong agentic powers. P93. Received elements of agency include our endowments, i.e., impulses, drives, and predispositions to react in certain ways to given situations. Becker here does a little bit of a useful detour into the concept of consciousness. He reminds us that Stoics are materialists and that we therefore reject any kind of mind-body dualism. Nonetheless, we do not endorse the reductive view that the mind and the body are identical, and that therefore mental activity can be explained away, in the way, say, in which the rising and setting of the sun is explained away by celestial mechanics. Rather, Becker's position is similar to that of philosopher of mind. Moreover, Larry takes note of the existence of two distinct types of processing of information in the human brain, unconscious and conscious. What Daniel Kahneman famously referred to as System 1 and System 2. If so, then of course the possibility exists that the two processes will yield contrasting results in any particular instance, generating intra-agentic conflicts, so to speak. This does not present a problem for Stoic philosophy, as already the ancient Stoics recognized the existence of non-deliberative behavioral dispositions. But they, like Aristotle, and like modern cognitive behavioral therapy, believed that the two systems can be linked by way of deliberate habituation. We consciously decide to engage in certain behaviors, and the more we do so, the more this generates an automatic disposition toward those behaviors. Virtue, in other words, is at least in part a matter of Stoic practice. Fun fact, known to the Stoics and amply confirmed by modern cognitive science, the power of agency can be manipulated, usually impaired, in a number of ways, for instance by way of chemicals, such as alcohol or drugs. That's probably why Diogenes Laertius said that Stoics will take wine but not get drunk. 1118. Our characters are then shaped over time by a combination of early dispositions that we have as infants, affects we develop by interacting with people and objects around us and so forth, in an iterative fashion. The results may be very different for different people. It is also the case that through the iterative learning processes mentioned above, some of us become basically trusting, optimistic, confident, outgoing, benevolent, non-aggressive children with high self-esteem. Others become basically distrustful, pessimistic, anxious, introverted, malevolent, and aggressive, with low self-esteem. What about the constructed elements of agency? These arise from the fact that, at some point in our development, call that the age of reason, around when we are seven years old, we acquire a rational capability to represent our purpose of activity to ourselves and others by symbolic means, i.e., by language. We then use our memory, imagination, and ability to generalize. The results of this activity include the ability to control, within limits, our impulses, the tendency toward reciprocity in dealing with others, the development of a certain degree of benevolence, as well as emotionality towards others. At a higher level of agentic development, we encounter traits such as courage, endurance, and perseverance, which begin to look a lot like stoic virtues. All of this made possible by building on natural human dispositions, augmented by our constant representing to ourselves our preferences and goals, while at the same time attempting to maximize their achievement through the continuous perfection of agency. Finally, we arrive at a constructed concept of who we are, an idea of self, and to the related virtue of integrity. By the time we develop the ability to represent the self other distinctions symbolically, we not only have a sharply defined body to refer to as the self, but a growing assortment of memories, attachments, projects, emotions, 
and behavioral dispositions as well that we include in our consciousness of ourselves as agents. Thus one sort of integrity project arises, an endeavor to exercise our agency in ways that are consistent with our image of ourselves, Pete 112. Of course, the crucial point here is not just that Stoicism is about developing agency. That's just what human beings in general do, including psychopaths. The idea, rather, is to develop healthy agency. But that modifier, healthy, requires further arguments. Here, Larry deploys the same metaphor used by the ancient Stoics, drawing a parallel between a healthy body and a healthy mind. A perfectly healthy human body has a complete and intact structure, standardly configured. All the parts of that structure, from skeleton to skin, function in their nominal ways. A perfectly healthy agency likewise has a complete inventory of intact, nominally functional elements and integrated homeostatic systems whose development is timely and complete. By 114. The idea is that psychological health will map on a good moral, i.e., virtuous character, while psychopathology will correlate with vice. To continue the analogy with physical fitness, just as the latter is the result of both one's constitution and of one's conscious efforts at training for muscles, aerobic capacity, etc., including, of course, a healthy diet, so is psychological health a matter of one's early dispositions of character, augmented by one's deliberate training in perf. The bulked-up muscles of a virtuoso bodybuilder may exclude her from many other pursuits, ballet or competitive swimming, for example. The intellectual dispositions of a virtuoso rational choice theorist may likewise exclude him from polite company. P. 119. Much has been written on the concept of the Stoic sage, and Larry's view of it, in agreement with Seneca's, is that this isn't a logical impossibility but rather the rare instance of a human being that has developed her virtuous agency to the upper limits possible for a member of our species. The sage is not perfect, whatever that means, and it is certainly not omniscient, but she would win the gold medal at the Olympics' specialty of virtue if there were such a thing, which there wouldn't be in the ideal Stoic Republic, because Stoics don't see much point in competing for the sake of showing one's superiority. Harry points out that there is no reason to believe that the development of virtuoso agency should result in one and only one kind of person. Even sages will be very different from each other. More pragmatically important, perhaps, is also, is contention, obvious by this point but worth reiterating, that whatever the ancient Stoics thought, we no longer have any reason to believe that virtue is limited to members of a particular gender, ethnicity, or religion. Stoicism and the practice of Stoic virtue is for everyone in a truly cosmopolitan spirit. Here is the next important step, which I can do no better than let Becker himself explain in some detail. Ideal Stoic agents will clearly have many of the traits that are standardly called virtues. They will act in a principled way toward others, treating similar cases similarly by criteria of fittingness and proportionality. That fits an ordinary description of a narrow sense of justice and is a trait that healthy agents will construct, and ideal ones, will perfect, from primal reciprocal responses, generalization, and rationality. They will exhibit justice in a wider sense of the term as well, for they will construct cooperative dispositions from the persistent need to integrate and optimize endeavors that arise from both their primal benevolence and their narrow self-interest, and to solutions to distributive questions that are rational and stable in a given social environment with a given set of resources. Wisdom in two senses is also included in the notion of ideal agency. Such agency is the practical ability to optimize the success of one's endeavors and means having wisdom in the narrow sense of practical intelligence, phrenesis, along with the knowledge necessary for effective deliberation and choice. But the move from healthy to fit agency and then to the limit of versatility for it, inevitably means that ideal agents will frame their deliberations in terms of what is best for their whole lives. That frame of reference, together with the enormous breadth and depth of knowledge required to make practical intelligence effective in it, surely qualifies as wisdom in a broad sense. Sophia. Courage, endurance, and perseverance 
are also parts of fit agency, as we mentioned earlier. And temperance or moderation, Safra sign, will be evident in the modulation of passion, affect, emotion, attachments and purposes necessary to integrate one's endeavors, personally and socially, in terms of an optimal whole. I have highlighted the four standard Stoic virtues in the passage above, in order to help the reader see the big picture of how, in Larry's mind, they are interconnected and fit nicely with his account of virtuous, and eventually virtuoso, agency. At this point, Becker returns to his crucial notion that virtue, ideal agency, and eudaimonia are tightly linked and completely interdependent within Stoic philosophy. Given all the above, ideal Stoic agency is both necessary and sufficient for achieving virtue, and virtue in turn is necessary and sufficient for eudaimonia. This also means that the virtues are indeed unified, in the specific, modern sense, that virtue is a single and comprehensive endeavor that guides the Stoic moral agent. The separate virtues are thought of as dispositions that need to be coordinated in order to yield ideal agency. Interestingly, Larry takes sides in the context of an ancient dispute among the Stoics themselves, and I think it is the right side he comes down in favor of. We do not imagine, as perhaps Chrysippus did, that the sage's very motivations are harmonized, with the result that desire and passion are unified with reason and will, thus producing tranquility by removing conflicts at their roots. Rather, we follow Posidonius in supposing that conflict remains constitutive of healthy, mature agency, and that the function of agency proper is to cope with it, not necessarily to root it out, P. Ba 126. This is more important than it may seem at first glance because the upshot is that whatever Chrysippus and perhaps Epictetus may have thought, a reasonable Stoic does not attempt to eliminate even the negative emotions, since that is, as a matter of fact, impossible for a human being, and thus in violation of what Becker calls the axiom of futility. Rather, Stoicism is about coping with the unhealthy aspects of our mental life while cultivating the healthy ones in what I have called an exercise in shifting the emotional spectrum. Next up, the argument for virtue as the product of ideal agency. The Aristotelians and the Stoics battled for the soul of their practitioners, so to speak. Already 23 centuries ago, after Stoicism was established in Athens by Zeno of Sidium, so this exchange belongs to a long tradition of which, I'm sure Dan would agree, the two of us are among the latest and least worthy interpreters. The debate was about the sufficiency, or not, of virtue for a eudaimonic life. The Stoics, together with their close cousins, the Cynics, argued that virtue is both necessary and sufficient. In particular, the four cardinal virtues of phrenesis, practical wisdom, courage, justice, and temperance. The Stoics, unlike the Cynics, also recognized that people want a number of other things, including health, wealth, education, love, friendship, and so forth. They referred to those as preferred indifference and to their negative counterparts, such as sickness, poverty, ignorance, etc., as dispreferred indifference. They are preferred because it is reasonable for people to pursue them, so long as they do so without compromising their virtue, i.e., their moral character. But they are indifferent because in themselves, they do not make one more or less virtuous. And since virtue is the only thing that matters for eudaimonia, they do not contribute to that either. It is a perfectly coherent system. But is it true? I will come back later to why I put scare quotes around that word. The Aristotelians thought not. As Dan says, their philosophy also belongs to the eudaimonic tradition and they too thought that virtue is necessary for a life worth living. But they did not think it was sufficient. Those things that the Stoics refer to as preferred are also needed. If your life does not, even through no fault of your own, include at least some health, wealth, education, and even good looks, you are screwed. No eudaimonia for you. The distinction sketched above makes Aristotelianism, an elitist philosophy, as it applies only to a subset of humanity. How large of a subset depends on the time and place, and also on just how much externals are really needed, 
Aristotle was pretty vague on this point. By contrast, Stoicism is for everyone, rich or poor, healthy or sick, educated or ignorant, you can still be eudaimon. Unlike the case of Aristotelianism where luck is needed for Stoics your eudaimonia is entirely up to you, Fortuna simply doesn't enter into the equation.